Good afternoon and welcome to the conference, The Work of Artists and the Logics of Deprofessionalization. This debate forms part of a broader program entitled The Cost of Art, Art Custa. This program was designed by Luisa Veloz, Liliana Coutinho and Vera Borges as a partnership between Kulturgest and ISCTE, the Universitary Institute of Lisbon and CIES, the Center of Sociology Research and Study at ISCTE, in order to reflect on the transformations, value and conditions of artistic work in the performing art worlds. Our objective here is to open up the space for debate and joint reflection, bringing together an institution that programs and commissions artistic work and an institution that research and foster a critical and constructive approach to art and culture while establishing a fruitful dialogue among artists, researchers, programmers, curators, institutions, and above all, a dialogue with a wider public. Let us now welcome an international, our international colleagues and thank them in advance for the important and valuable collaborations that they make to this debate. Pierre-Michel Menger is a professor at the Collège de France, Chair de Sociologie du Travail Créateur, Sociology of Creative Work. He is also Director d'études uh, at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales à Paris. And uh, he is a great pioneer in the studies of the artistic work, professions, organizations, and labor markets over the last three decades in France. One of, these most, of his most important work uh, books is entitled The Economics of Creativity, Art and Achievement Under Uncertainty published by Harvard University Press. He was especially invited here to speak of the precarious nature of the arts and the culture professions from an international perspective, approaching the question of intermittence in the arts, which has helped in debating in the French context. From our perspective, it is, an, it is important to grasp what his behind these models of support for the arts, understand their weakness over time, recognize at what point they become depleted, and in such cases, what are the existing alternatives. This uh, involves what type of organizations we want and may be able to have in Portugal within a context we wish to be plural, but in which work and job insecurity and discontinuity have long since been the prevailing reality. Isabella Wagner is a professor of sociology at the Collegium Civitas, uh, Warsaw, Poland, and associate researcher uh, with the Dynamics European, CNRS, University of Strasbourg, and research fellow at the Convergence Migration Institute. Her book, Producing Excellence, Making the Making of Virtuosos, uh, represents sociological research of enormous interest. The professor is here invited to discuss artistic careers in the ways in which the economic crisis crystallized the reflection on art versus art as a profession and the demands for professionalization has both a case and a consequence of the situation experienced in the labor market. In our view, it is highly important to reflect on artistic vocations, what paradox drive this market, simultaneously so glamorous and so precarious, which swings between the reputations of the virtuosos and the eternal invisibles, between the abundance and the scarcity of paying work, to use the words of Pierre-Michel Menger. Finally, um, we would recall that in the, in the comments of this live streaming, Kulturgest is sharing a microsite featuring further information on the program with content for conference speakers, artists and producers. We will similarly remind you that the debate shall, uh, shall be open to all at the end of the two speeches. Podem começar a enviar agora as vossas questões a partir do momento em que os nossos uh, interlocutores começarem uh, então as suas conferências. Uh, e submeter no Facebook e nos, na, na caixa de comentários também do Facebook e do YouTube. Um, we will now open the debate uh, with Pierre-Michel Menger. Hi, thank you. Thank you, 
for having me. Uh, thank you, Vera, Mariana, Luisa, and the technical crew. And uh, uh, hi, everybody in Lisbon and in Portugal. And uh, it's always a pleasure to be there, but this time not. And I hope uh, can be done again uh, when the various viruses overcome. So I'm a French sociologist, uh, as Vera mentioned, and uh, I did uh, empirical studies of artistic labor markets. As you know, artistic labor markets are highly flexible, but what does that exactly mean? Labor flexibility usually refers to two different meanings. The first one is the so-called numerical flexibility. A flexible labor management in that sense applies mainly to low-skilled workers, uh, easier to hire and to lay off in case of downturn. The second kind of flexibility is the so-called functional uh, flexibility that takes advantage of the core characteristics of professional work in the arts, autonomy, responsibility, and that prevails in challenging non-routine work situations. That flexibility refers to the, the way non-routine and autonomous work uh, is managed. Usually, either of these flexibilities prevails in different sectors, but uh, it turns out that the creative labor markets make extensive use of both flexibility, yet their impact on the individual employment situation in the arts represents a challenge, since it may decrease the odds of sustainable careers. What are exactly the facts? Um, Yes, artists we know are better trained than the average workforce and they experience much higher income inequality too. Indeed, we know from countless surveys that four-fifths of earnings and amounts of work are enjoyed by one-fifth of professionals in the arts. That's really huge inequality. Despite that, artists value autonomy, a sense of self-development and uh, lack of root, sorry, um, should, yeah, that's, that's my roadmap. Um, develop self, some self-development and lack of routine in their work. Non-routine, as we know, correlates with creativity. We also know that creative occupations not only experience all kinds of flexible work, but try to mitigate precariousness uh, by means of multiple job holding, uh, collective resource, resource pooling, income transfers, public support, and private patronage. Uh, my presentation will mainly deal with the French system uh, I have extensively studied, but comparisons, of course, can be made uh, with abroad uh, situations. Uh, in France, a safety net has been designed to meet the challenges of high employment flexibility in the performing arts. As I will show from the 1980s onward, the system ran at full speed and the resulting combination of highly flexible employment and highly flexible compensation for interstitial uh, unemployment spells has since then played a major role in the boom of cultural supply in the French performing arts and media industry by sustaining a project-based organization of production. Yet the combination of flexible working patterns and recurrent individual underemployment may also lead to overtaxing social welfare mechanisms if they are pushed to the limit by the employers and not properly regulated. Um, uh, flexibility is both intended to minimize fixed production costs and to enhance search for novelty um, and originality. Following uh, Stinchcombe's, um, sorry, that's, uh, yeah. Stinchcomb, pioneering works. Art Stinchcomb is a very famous sociologist, very inspiring one. We can assume that search for flexibility is a core feature of creative work due to, I quote, the high rate of change over time of the content of, 
content or activities. Uh, as you know, creative products are prototypes, the combination of activities needed to produce a play, a movie, a playwright, or an opera involves a large number of different creative occupations, uh, and this shifts from project to project. And consumer versatility and taste for novelty give special value to newness and originality. Uh, so success is more or less unpredictable. Uh, so there is substantial flexibility in it. Flexibility means that for each project, new teams are formed and then dispersed. And of course, there are networks helping to build stable relations that are needed to lower transaction costs. But also, there are increasingly uh, a, brokerage, a brokerage system that enhances the role of talent agencies in mediating the labor market for contingent employment. Uh, employ employers minimize their business risk by using contractual relationships that transmit the market uncertainty down the value chain to individual workers. And when a flexible employment system operates like that, what are exactly the effects? Uh, first, the expansion of creative industries leads to a rapid increase in the population of employers and small organizations. As my research on the performing arts in France uh, has shown, uh, as I will show in figure one um, here, uh, you have this curve is the upper curve is the number of uh, the, the very fast growth of the numbers of the number of employers, the population of employers. But what this graph shows also is that there is an increase in the number of artists at the second curve. Uh, it's very impressive too. Uh, it's based on indexes starting from 1986 uh, up to 2007. Um, but the situation is almost the same since then. Uh, and the number of artists may be far from corresponding to, this, to a similar increase in the level of activity. The level of activity is the amount of work days paid. And uh, this is here in the black with the black squares, uh, the, the bottom curve. As you see, there is a gap. And that's, that's the mechanics of disintegration of labor markets due to flexibility. Um, in fact, labor supply, that means the number of artists, uh, has evolved at rates of increase much higher than the total amount of work days uh, and the total amount of wages. Wages are here, uh, sorry. Uh, wages are here and the uh, work days are here and the number of artists is here. So, um, and you can figure out that this uh, flexibility required by a system of project-based organization creates highly a high frictional un unemployment at any given moment. The number of artists and managerial and technical workers too, of course, uh, that are available uh, for employment must be significantly higher than the number of jobs allocated and distributed between projects underway in order to ensure that the game of rapid staff reallocation between projects can move on unhindered. The overall result is a quite paradoxical one. Both employment and unemployment have been increasing. This is totally paradoxical. Um, the consequences of that unbalanced growth are highlighted in figure two and three. Um, so figure two means that the average amount of working time uh, here, working time in figure two, two uh, the average amount of working time in the creative industries per worker has decreased. Uh, although there, there was a boom in this industry and uh, in the performing arts. Um, and the, as you see, the technical and managerial workers are in better shape than the artists. Uh, they, they have, 
they have not been hit that much by the, the evolution, but the artists are in, 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 worse, in the worst condition uh, in, in this respect. And uh, for the earnings, uh, this figure shows you the earnings evolution against in the index is 100 in, 80, in 1986. And again, you see there, there is a decrease. And, and there is this gap between technicians and artists. So um, artists, the gap can be explained, in fact, because artists receive shorter job assignment and experience tougher individual competition than technical personnel. Um, um, in a project-based organization of work, the risk of um, uh, unemployment is pervasive. Typical worker will view the risk of unemployment as something that must be compensated for by some mechanism, for example, a higher wage. And that's the case, in fact, at least on an hourly basis. In fact, in the performing arts, intermittent artists and workers earn much higher hourly wages than uh, those employed on a long-term basis. Um, the wage premium is the price that employers must pay in order to draw on a reserve army of underemployed individuals whose availability has to be secured. A loss of flexibility in employment decisions would be much costlier for firms. However, and that's important, very important. The compensating differential scheme operates only partially since hourly wages are not higher for greatly underemployed workers than for their more successful fellows who are frequently rehired and can build continuity in their career. Individual differences in hiring probabilities are therefore not subject to compensation. That is simply to say that artists, as well as technical workers in the performing arts, build their career on the basis of their reputation. Again, in contingent work settings, the risk of unemployment is pervasive. In most countries, access to unemployment insurance benefits is beyond the reach of freelancers. But in France, uh, freelancing has been equated with a salary job and is eligible to unemployment compensation. How does, does the combination of employment and compensated unemployment work? Um, workers must accumulate enough working days within a certain period of time in order to qualify for unemployment insurance payments whenever they become unemployed. And when qualified, they enter what I call a compensation entitlement period. See here the, the graph, uh, during which they can work on short-time contracts and nevertheless stay in the unemployment insurance system. During these work days, they get, of course, uh, when they work, no unemployment benefits. Each of these working periods is taken into account so that the, the worker, if she accumulates enough of these job records, is allowed to requalify for the next compensation period as soon as her current entitlement ends. Uh, and this is shown in this picture. Um, the picture, the, the, the situation is divided in four in four situations, four positions. A compensation, a carence, that means uncompensated waiting periods, short-time employment spells, and, uh, um, and the people cycle between these different situations. And uh, the, 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 the goal is to remain inside this situation as long as possible without too many gaps between one period to the other. Uh, the flexibility of that system uh, has been exploited more and more intensively 
both by your employers who can say, okay, you are safe. I can make what I want uh, for, of, for you, of you. And so, because you are compensated for your periods of unemployment. So exploited more and more intensively by the employers and by the intermittent workers, of course, who learned how to take advantage of self, such a flexi security system. Um, but the consequence of that is a bit uh, surprising. The average length of unemployment employment contracts has been diminishing uh, during that time, uh, as you see in this uh, on this graph. Uh, I distinguish between artists in the audiovisual and the live performing arts, and technicians in the audiovisual and live performing arts, and the different. Uh, curves and um, so the situation is always the same. Um, there's there is a decrease, uh, and uh, uh, so the average job duration has been decreasing almost constantly during the two booming decades, having shorter spells of employment located in compensated unemployment periods, helped employers to provide their, co their workers with shelters to buffer the, un the underemployment risk without incurring, incurring the cost of securing long-term career prospects. Um, there is a, another result uh, I can show you on this figure, uh, but it's hard to, to, to read, but uh, I, I give you the, the clue. Uh, there is a kind of unbalanced expansion of the sector that can be summarized in a paradoxical trend. While labor demand increased, the total amount of uh, unemployment benefit expenses increased as, increased it as well, and even faster than the total amount of wages. So as growth in the creative industry sector was based on rising contention work, its ins insurance component increasingly leaned on transfer resources. This is the, the main lesson of this paradoxical growth in the creative industries in France. Um, so between the employer, the contingent worker and the insurance, there is a kind of strategic game. It's no wonder that the French unemployment system have, that they have depicted run into increasing and cumulative deficits over the three last decades. And you see that on this graph uh, in, um, in, in red is the total deficit. In blue, uh, you have the amount of payroll taxes collected and in green, the total amount of, uh, of allowances to workers and artists. So this part is a deficit and accumulating. So it's a kind of unbalanced growth and the deficit is part is seen as a kind of contribution to the poly cultural policy in France, but it's not paid by the state. It's paid by the whole workforce, which uh, solidarity is uh, asked to play uh, its role to support the, this particular system. Um, this intricate unemployment unemploy and compensated unemployment system has been so under recurrent reform pressures uh, for the last three decades, each time arousing huge uh, uh, dramatic and public protests and strikes by, by artists as well as by an enormous amount uh, and rising also an enormous amount of experts assessments and reports. But uh, note here that employers and their workforce have fought hand in hand in order to preserve the insurance scheme that allows for the former, that means employers to draw at will on a very large pool of available workers and therefore to turn their fixed labor costs, costs into variable, entirely variable costs while providing the workers with a sophisticated means to compensate for structural underemployment and the piecemeal allocation of work. Um, there is another aspect and less known that all what I said be just uh, up to now. This is the long-term life course view, the retirement. 
how does flexibility impact the last part of a worker's life course? One of my students, Vincent Cardon, did explore the long-term consequences of the intermittent employment scheme in the performance of France, and especially in the impact on pensions. He shows that a steady decrease on retirement pensions of workers um, illustrates the unexpected effects of a growing interconnectedness between direct wages and unemployment compensation. Here is the, the trend. Uh, as you see, the, 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 the level of pensions has been decreasing too. And uh, this, is, this is, of course, very uh, a major concern for people. And the, the level is very low. It's extremely low. So it's very usual for artists to work uh, long after the official time ret of retirement. Uh, up to 70 or 80s, maybe it's part of the, the, the dream of an artist, but of course it's also a constraint. Um, uh, and in this uh, graph, you see the difference between the technical workers, uh, the upper curve and the artists. Again, it's a, there is a huge gap. Uh, they are all uh, employed under the same scheme. That means high flexibility, but uh, flexibility hits the people differently uh, according to their uh, position in the division of labor. Artists are hit much more severely than, than, uh, than technicians. Um, so a, a, a wrap up to conclude. Uh, flexible work systems are built on networks, reputation, short-term contracts, and highly individualized performance rating. Uh, that's the, the, the key uh, the core of the system, employment system, of course. Um, the functional advantage is obvious for occupations whose attractiveness is mainly based on work autonomy, responsibility, self-control and teamwork, extended range of skills, and sensing sense of initiative, creativity, driven commitment to work, individualized reputation based on track records and team project organization of work. However, uh, flexible work systems also magnify the skewness of earnings, the inequality in earnings, and hiring's distribution, which is the same. Uh, you earn what you are able to work, uh, the amount of your work, uh, plus the, the price of your reputation. Uh, and transferring the risk down to the workforce in these integrated organizational settings triggers risk management schemes whose efficiency, as I sh have shown, or I hope I can uh, comment on that more, but uh, that's the, the main, uh, the, the main uh, content of my presentation. Uh, the efficiency of the risk management schemes faces various challenges, individually and collectively. And this is the, the cover of the book uh, Vera mentioned, if you want to know a bit more about this. It's self advertisement. So thank you for your attention. And uh, I will stop sharing the screen to give the floor to Isabella. Isabella Wagner. Thank you very much for having me tonight. And um, uh, you will see immediately the difference uh, between the qualitative and quantitative sociologists. Uh, I, I choose for this night um, some very specific words and I will focus on them from the topic uh, of this evening. So this is the work uh, artists and today. This is very important because I will speak mainly about what uh, uh, happening now uh, because of this very exceptional um, pandemics and very hard time that faced uh, artists but also other professionals. Uh, uh, so uh, instead of the introduction just to warm up, uh, this is one week ago, London, I don't know if you are familiar, but the British musicians organized a manifestation. Uh, they performed 
uh, music. Uh, they were music uh, musician, orchestra musicians, and they played together, uh, staying in a, a social distancing, and uh, they played only twenty percent of uh, the piece. Why? Because they protest in uh, such a way against the huge cuts and the decisions of the government about just exactly the coverage. Uh, so it happened on the 6th um, October. I would say that uh, I work uh, in uh, this field since uh, late 90s, uh, but I was trained as a musician firstly. Uh, I, I'm coming from the country, from Poland, in which musician was very highly respectable uh, profession before 89, after it changed a little bit. Uh, but uh, I never asked myself, and it was never uh, the question if we are professionals. We were professionals. It was one of the most respected professions in the Eastern Europe. It was not only Polish specificity. Um, I'm not focusing in my work on a professionalization because this is the, like a um, long tradition in sociology also to not focusing on this. This is coming from tradition of Chicago from 40s of the previous cycles and um, instead of uh, being uh, trying to be similar to professions, so mainly medical profession, I will focus on the specificity of the artistic professions. I'm following here uh, this tradition and also the, the um, sociologists who uh, reproduce this tradition and continue this tradition, like uh, Howard Becker, for example. I will. Um, I, I would like to attract your attention to mirror paradox. Uh, I tell it. I call it like this. Why? Because uh, uh, last years in neoliberal world, we can uh, observe the action of several uh, coach and management specialists. Uh, they are uh, looking for artistic professions and they're saying, you should be like them. Every one of, uh, not workers, but managers, etc., should act like artists. And we artists uh, uh, or uh, people who are working in artistic professions, we try to be professionalized. So we are looking at each other and uh, uh, trying to be another, instead perhaps to be uh, to, to take advantage to ref to reflect on ourselves. So today I will speak um, about the uh, practice of artists. Uh, they work, they situation, they adjustment to to this emergency situation, and I will finish on relationship with societies and their social roles. Uh, I have a huge problem to speak about the artists in general. Why? Because perhaps I'm field worker, means that I go, I meet the people and I stay with them several years sometimes. So for me, uh, it is very um, difficult to speak uh, about artists uh, in the total. Uh, you have see here on a, my presentation and right, I uh, specified uh, the group of artists and even about musicians, we, we have several different uh, professions inside of uh, musicians. And uh, on the left side of the um, presentation, you see uh, the different statuses. So on the top, you have state workers because you have some countries in which uh, some artists uh, on the prestigious orchestra, they are state workers. And on the bottom, you have black market. And just at, on the up, you have freelancers. And the black market represents a lot. We don't know exactly how much in different countries. It is probably different, but this is like huge uh, um, possibility of income for several types of artists. So you have also personal situation which can modify situation of artists, especially financial situation, if they are married with another artist or they are married with doctors or uh, managers, etc. Their situation, especially today, will be different. And we have also supplementary job. 
frequently they're teaching, they're doing uh, different uh, types of job which uh, are connected with the arts, but they're not specifically uh, artistic jobs. You see here, I put in a red, I will focus on musicians because I worked uh, much more time uh, on them and uh, orchestra musicians and virtuoso. I started my work with the virtuoso musicians uh, in 2015, uh, I published this work, uh, which was translated into Chinese and Russian, which shows how these societies are interested in production of excellence in arts and in music. Um, but um, I would say that this is very specific work, which is based on creativity, passion and emotion. And also I ask, because I'm sociologist of work, uh, I, I raise the question uh, about the income, how they live, etc., etc. Uh, for um, this speech today, I connected uh, with some of uh, my participants, uh, that means the people who I interviewed and studied during several years, and uh, they provide um, the account of their present situation, which was very interesting. So it was people um, uh, from different countries in the world, and I will try today to show you different case studies. It will be not like deep, uh, large studies, only the pointing on uh, specific situations. Uh, perhaps you read the um, biography of Yehudi Menuhin. He's speaking that in the 50s, Japan is an amazing country because in each uh, guy's gas station, you can hear the classical music and Chopin, etc. Uh, also, Italy uh, has this reputation of lovers of opera, so amazing country. Also, Poland, uh, Chopin and the violin, etc., etc. So, the, the three completely different countries and cultures have this reputation that, uh, oh, society loves music. But how about the musician's work? On the right side, uh, transnational, uh, transnational uh, musicians, this is uh, the book of um, Beata Kowalczyk about precociousness and about very difficult situation of Japanese musicians. And today, um, the situation is very difficult because of the COVID, even if Japan is not shut down at all, but the uh, concerts are limited, everything is uh, really, uh, complicated and the musicians uh, were in ordinary situation precarious but today they're in very difficult situation except some of them in the most prestigious orchestra but this difference is really uh, huge um, now for Italy if you are requesting if a sociologist in Italy uh, takes seriously uh, music as a profession or artistic work as a profession here, Sociologia del Lavoro, last number. So the, the, the devoted to artistic work and contemporary capitalist societies. You have also here uh, in Italy, sociologist Clementina Casula, who worked uh, about economical situation of musicians. And she also uh, reflected on this precariousness. Um, I would uh, like to attract your attention on a work in progress of Ikeda Mariko and Morgner uh, Christian, who uh, are doing the study, comparative study about musicians in COVID, and they are comparing Berlin and London and uh, Tokyo. So it will be very interesting to see how musicians uh, react to this uh, crisis. You have also the collective working in music, uh, which has very specific uh, COVID uh, part of work. Now, Germany, so societies that care about musicians, it will be Germany for sure. They have a, a lot of or orchestra musicians, they lot, a lot of orchestra, and they had in this crisis situation, 80% of salary uh, supported by the state and 20% 20, 20 uh, were additional and independent from the orchestra, from the cities, from the regions, etc., etc. Uh, and musicians took part in a 
important negotiations. That is very important. And we need to keep in mind that the organizations, the unions to be uh, cooperative between uh, artists, it's uh, really painful. Uh, Germany also organized support of freelancers, even if it was uh, not very not so efficient. Here you have the picture of musicians who are playing with social distancing and also public that is uh, listening to this uh, music also with social distancing. This is uh, really awkward to see this kind of picture. Uh, you have also uh, a very interesting um, phenomenon that I observed speaking with this artist that they took the time of relax, partial relax or really long relax, like two months of the break for uh, uh, for uh, thinking about changing the world in which we are performing the arts. And here, very interesting ecological issue means that if it is really sustainable going, taking the plane and uh, playing uh, in, other, in another part of the world, how about the carbon impact environment, uh, in environmental issue? And this discourse I found very uh, present in uh, Finland. Uh, where the uh, unions, uh, they are take care, not about how we will survive the COVID, but how we will take this COVID occasion for changing our world. So I call it even in heaven, because for musicians, when you uh, listen to them frequently, they're saying, oh, in Finland, it's amazing. It's uh, very good and, and we're really uh, important there. Uh, this is uh, very important uh, to think that in this period of crisis where everyone is uh, lost, depressed, etc., uh, people are going into culture and uh, uh, Finnish musicians, they are underlining this. Here you have the picture of this small boy who is taking the piano lesson online. So this is a huge uh, change. Uh, I think that one year ago, the uh, majority of musicians uh, who uh, I interviewed never would agree that something like online courses could be really effective. Uh, so um, you have also, despite this huge uh, uh, good organization and huge help from the uh, state, etc., from the orchestra, you have However, uh, the freelancers, musicians who have difficulty to survive and as in Japan, as in Poland and in other countries, they are obliged to do such basic works as a food delivery or a kind of uh, really junk jobs. But again, here, this is a huge reflection towards a more sustainable music sector. Mixed situation in Belgium uh, that have a similar, a little bit similar uh, system to France. Uh, they, the freelancers who are uh, very good uh, soloists, etc., they have access. It is much more difficult to get this access to the protected status of artists. But once you get it, you can keep it much easier than in France. That is the difference. And some of my interviewees took the teaching as a solution, but for them, it was a tragedy because they stopped to, to play and they should devote their time to teaching, what, which is not their preferred uh, um, side of being artists. And uh, some people reflect on ch changing the profession. So you are in the middle of career, you are a very successful artist and COVID will push you to this idea of perhaps I should do another job, start another study, do something else. So it is a very um, interesting phenomenon again. Uh, here also a lot of musicians think about the population uh, in the classical music, about the population of, uh, about the aging of their uh, public. And they're saying, we need to go back to the school, not to, uh, back, we back to the school, but back came uh, with our instruments, uh, our music, classical music to the school as it is uh, performed in Finland very well. 
UK, it is very um, a stressful situation for them because they're crossing the two crises, huge crises, this Brexit, which uh, completely changed the market in the UK because they had a lot of foreigner artists, etc. And it is a huge destabilization and chaos. And uh, with COVID, a lot of people uh, lost their uh, income. Mm, but for that, for, for some who were um, who worked very well and had a lot of teaching, the, this moment of uh, cutting the possibility of uh, a live performance was the occasion to be back to the recording, and a lot of artists pushed their old projects, they're not finished projects or already recorded, but not prepared and elaborated project into, um, into work. And everyone is underlining the importance of technology. And everyone is saying, thanks God, we have the internet now. How we can do this like 10 years ago even, or 20 years ago, it will be really tragedy. Um, in the UK, still, um, one person told me that she lost 30% uh, of the income because also some parents or some students were really not um, open to even start uh, via internet lessons. So we need also to think about this uh, period of accommodation and adaptation because it is for a lot of people far of technology. But it is also lost of the um, income in the families, in the people around, the music and uh, cultural activities. There were lux luxury activities or extra. So this is the first budget cut budget in the situation of crisis. Here, very interesting, because this person told me that the first person to tell me like this, I believe that the state has responsibility to continue financially supporting the artists, music education, etc, etc. So this is this huge conviction that it should be uh, taken into consideration, uh, not uh, let people completely alone. Where people are letting completely around, probably it is in the US. And here it's like a nightmare. 5% of unemployment means that when you work in a very good orchestra, what you will get, it will be only 5% of your salary, but not for the small salary, for the good salary. It means that those who were already not very well with their income, they will have really hard, hard time. Musicians are living in New York City apartment. You know that Manhattan is cost very well, very high, and they are not even uh, able to survive in this apart this this place and they also experience you you know what happened um, some months ago in New York with the crisis of covid and the worst thing what could happen it is the huge problem with health coverage and that all musicians uh, actually I could say that my interviewees could be divided between two groups, those who had uh, the health coverage and those who haven't. So this is very important, I think, basic information for uh, each uh, group of artists, this access to health coverage. But uh, some, as, as you know, for in uh, artistic, the specificity of artistic uh, profession is also this, which uh, we knew, for example, in Eastern Europe during the previous uh, era of communism and hard uh, censorship, uh, that the best creations were uh, born in the context of the limit, uh, limiting context in the uh, difficult times. And here also, a lot of people are thinking and taking time, they have time for doing new projects uh, in this uh, tragic context. And here, unfortunately, I cannot uh, use the possibility of uh, showing you the movie and the music. But that, that is my uh, regret that it is not a um, possibility to do this. But um, it is, for example, this requiem for the person who lost their life or lost their families, etc. The musicians were hardly touched by uh, the COVID. Um, however, 
even if this music is very hard, it is also a lot of positive thing uh, inside of this art uh, because it is always this message, we will persevere and come out stronger together. And here I would like to let music, classical music for a little bit and saying that one of the most evident um, uh, role of the artist today in this hard period is psychological support. And we see here in completely different uh, style of music, this is African music. Uh, uh, you have the new African anathem, for example. I don't know if you know it, but it is very popular among Africans. And this is the message which is sent in different languages, in English, Arabic, French, Portuguese, Swahili, Xamosa, Amharic, etc. They put together the songs and uh, they are saying that because nobody is safe until everybody is safe, means that we need to take care um, each one uh, on others. And this is very important message that uh, this artist and other artists are sending. And some uh, positive, uh, perhaps, uh, news, and this is yesterday, uh, the uh, Journal of uh, uh, String Musicians, Strad, and they are saying that three quarters of Brits have turned to musical instruments during, during a lockdown, new research shows. Means that perhaps this crisis times, it will be the new opening for the new possibilities and new markets and uh, especially changing the value in a society uh, and attracting people into other uh, values than um, income and money and uh, produc production of goods. Artists are important and not because uh, they uh, should be a model for capitalist employees with this flexibility and creativity and especially working for nothing, but because of the social roles. And here I would like to uh, uh, probably not remember because it was not published uh, into English, but in 37, Florian Znaniecki, very uh, one of the fathers of sociology, one of his very um, important texts was social role of artist, 37. And for him, he said, this is a person for whom the production or independent production, uh, independent reproduction of works of art is a specific social function. So he's saying that be careful, we need to be careful, this is a social function. And we, uh, artist is socially valuable. And I think that we, uh, 100, almost 100 years after he wrote it, we forget about it. Uh, and all society forget about it. And he says, this is why he, artist, is getting some rights, such as the material support and foremost, the specific moral position. So basically in this text, Znaniecki is saying that what France implemented, uh, the social support, material support, uh, it, this is the, each society should elaborate such uh, support for the artists because they are necessary to each society. And he say also, this is important that the artist is created by the community. So I think that thinking about the future of the artist, we need to bring back this idea of social bonds and I call it social contract. And I would like to attract your attention to double play uh, and double role. In the ordinary time, the, like 10 years ago, this is entertaining and education mainly. But emergency mode, emergency time is today. We have entertaining virtually. We have more accessibility. It is huge democratization. Some says, others says that it is not really democratization, but it is true that uh, via internet, a lot of people can go to the opera, can, can follow the concerts, etc. The theaters are open, which was not the case before. But uh, um, this is also focused education. You see here on your right, this is the Indian artist who presented the gods, but with the message of wearing the masks. 
but it is also important for political struggles uh, to, to be soul and conscious of society and to warn society about the dangers because the artists, they have imagination, they are emotionally much more developed, so they are sensitive to uh, dangerous changes. I, I'm specifically attentive to the issue of uh, uh, refugees because uh, last two years I worked uh, in this area and I think that this is very important role and here it is like iconic the role of Banksy and even without uh, buying this shape who is saving the life on Med Mediterranean Sea but the artists are already on the march on this, of the society. We are used to uh, perceive the artists like this. And outsiders, they are out of the society. So this is the perfect bridge which can uh, put people together and uh, merge this newcomers with the host society. This is very important role to care for discriminated population. Other social role is emotional support, the use of humor via internet. This is a perfect example of Itzhak Perlman, all lovers of classical music. Uh, I invite you for, uh, you can be a friend with him on a Facebook and each day you have amazing anecdotes and small piece of violin. It is really positive. I'm addicted to that and we love him around the world and it, he is amazing. Unfortunately, again, I cannot present his music here. This is the project which he conducted despite of the um, technical difficulties. You know, this is the core. This is very difficult. We have difficulties. We are four speakers and it was like huge job of preparation, etc. They are like um, 40 people here and playing with um, uh, Perlman, the snow of Elga. It is amazing performance, really uh, encouraging because at the end we see this message of the hope. One moment he's showing the empty spaces of the conservatory, nothing is there, instruments are not touched, it's silence, but at the end uh, they, 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 uh, we have hope that everything will be back. Very interesting phenomenon also, uh, which you can uh, watch just a trailer of the festival online, new thing for the ballet, Batsheva Ballet from uh, Tel Aviv, amazing ballet. And here you have the sequences of the private life of the artist. And this is something which is very um, common now. We see persons in their interior and we can go closer to them. So to what point it is close you can see uh, uh, watching this trailer because it was even someone who is taking the shower you can see them or washing the thieves so but this is really a very specific and very significant phenomenon in our life this is my uh, uh contribution to the writers uh, the, um, you, you see here Politica, it's a magazine, Polish magazine, uh, also October. Olga, Tokarska, uh, Olga Tokarczuk is Nobel Prize winner of 2018. And she is really the person, the artist who is taking responsibility, responsibility to show and to speak openly about the, uh, the populist dangers and about the fascism that is coming uh, in Poland and uh, about the necessity of the struggle for the democracy. Uh, it is very um, difficult time and very uh, dangerous situation. And she's saying that we stop to understand the complexity of the world. And she's claiming that the reading and being uh, with the arts is helping us to be not black and white. So that is my uh, last uh, uh, sociological proposition. Uh, this is the types of uh, artistic activity in the emergency time, in the ordinary time, and the artistic role, and the contract, social contract with the society. Uh, and I was inspired by Michael Buravoy, who did it for sociology, different types of sociology, activity in sociology. I see here public and engaged uh, artists 
as something which help us both us means artists to survive to the, today but we society uh, to also survive thanks to them but also perhaps to see the kind of open window and to think now to take this time we're uh, stopped we need to stop to think take this time to imagine future society and uh, Preparing this uh, uh, talk, I was asked what artists need. I said, uh, we need only listen to them. We as a society, yes, they will tell us what they need because there are different types and etc. as I uh, uh, said previously. So we need really to discuss closely with them. And um, I use uh, I am using here this uh, very beautiful uh, wish of uh, Finnish Union of Musicians. Uh, they are saying that our life will change, but not only because COVID, uh, etc., but because we want to change this life. And we, the artists, we need to take the agency. And I think that this is the main um, uh, issue that every one of my respondents uh, told uh, me that we need to be together and we need to uh, really uh, take advantage of this very difficult situation. Now, instead of conclusion, I, I have this artistic stretto. It is very difficult because uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this um, um, film which was uh, created by Museo Prado and dancers of flamenco and their slogan is in defense of culture as a link that transcends all borders and I took because I was ready to show you this film but here I took the pictures for showing you uh, which kind of borders the artist can trans transcend only look this is the dance and amazing paintings and it is i promise you amazing music so here uh blocking the uh you know taboo about uh, not touching religion etc here this is the christ the dancer is like a christ who is descending of the cross yes here you have gender trans transcendence because uh, here you were familiar, certainly. Uh, the man is never dancing using the scarf and the uh, in this bath, yes, the um, dress. So this is also the discussion with the holy pictures. Uh, here you have this uh, uh, King George and uh, uh, transgression of ethnicity, ethnicity, because the dancer is perfectly dressed as a samurai. So this is completely new. Here you have uh, this uh, Velasquez, which is completely alive. Uh, and the dancer is uh, performing flamenco, but with the uh, Aldo Meola e Paco de Lucia music, which is also a transgression because the pure flamenco was never like this. Here you, you see El Greco and impossible challenge, imagine, this film could be never turned in the usual situation because the museum is never empty for so long time and the artists, they're busy in their other occupations. So here, this is really how the emergency was transformed positively. And here I call this fourth grace because behind you have three graces and she is uh, really amazing performing uh, and stepping uh, flamenco. And that is the last picture uh, all together um, and really enjoying uh, this dance. Uh, this is beautiful and moving. So uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, or thanks to organizers and Vera Luisa, and Mariana and uh, uh, Maria, and Clara and all people who uh, made this event possible. And thank you to all my uh, interviewees and friends and other persons who helped me uh, discussing this issue and also 
Museum Prado Permanent Music Program and Sebastian Peshko, Katarzyna Brua Weiss. And if you would like to listen to this music, I have a website, and this is just on the bottom, isabellawagner.com. And tomorrow I'm putting all this talk with the music. So you will see how amazingly musicians and other artists are dealing with this difficult situation. Obrigado por atención. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Isabella, for such an optimistic uh, <laughs> uh, presentation. I would also like to uh, thank Pierre Michel for for his marvelous presentation. I think they are quite uh, complementary. Uh, I would also, I, I would just would like to to ask the people who are seeing the conference that they can. Uh, write and send their questions or comments to uh, our two main speakers on the um, YouTube or by Facebook. I will, I will say it also in Portuguese. Se quiserem, uh, podem colocar as vossas questões uh, uh, por escrito no Facebook ou no, no, no YouTube. Eu vou estar aqui com uma plataforma ao lado, vou estando atenta às questões que forem, que forem sendo uh, colocadas. Uh, maybe just to start, then we can go to the questions that uh, people will, uh, will just ask. I, we have already some questions, I will just wait for, for, for the people to stress. So it's interesting to see that um, as Pierre Michel was, was presenting, we have uh, a trend that it's a long-term one that you have been studying for a long time. And now we have this crisis situation that uh, Isabella just presented uh, also in an optimistic point of view, which is, <laughs> which is important. But also it is important to, to discuss how how will everything will come up and if you think that the crisis situation just uh, uh, just kept the situation the same if it is worst and uh, for one, 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 one issue that I think it's important that uh, Isabella just talked about and that will be interesting also to, to know how the French situation is is do you think considering all the trend that uh, you presented, Pierre Michel, and uh, and nowadays situation, how important it is that artists organize themselves? So I think uh, this is an, an important issue that we also have it here in, in, in Portugal. And also, on the other hand, how looking at the scenario that you presented, Pierre Michel, and also considering the various uh, experiences that Isabella was presenting, how do you see that the role of the state will be really, the, in, in what spheres, in what dimensions, it's more important to, to, to do something if we can take it generally. We know that flexibility and uh, precariousness, it's a question, but are there main issues considering organized artists organization and the role of the state in public policy to to be, be taken into account thank you i will any one of you who would like to start it's okay for, for us then i will just present you the questions that we have now maybe after the one first uh, round from you so um maybe i can uh, give you some replies uh, to the, your questions. Uh, in France, actually, the, the safety net has been extended, and that's the benefit of our French system. Uh, the, at least in the performing arts, that means when people are equated to salary workers, the safety net built out of uh, made out of unemployment and compensated unemployment and employment. But there is no employment at all uh, in the live performing arts at, at this time. But uh, people, there is an agreement that the, the rights of uh, performing artists are extended up to mid 2021. So that's the kind of, uh, of course, of strong support uh, paid by this, not the state, but the unemployment insurance system. And uh, 
the state regarding your so that means also that the collective uh, force of artists organized in the world that means there are strong now in order to uh, overcome some of the main difficulties they face uh, today uh, but uh, on the other side the people uh, like autos writers uh, uh, songwriters etc to composers who are not salaried workers they are in the worst situation they are independent workers and they are hit made massively by uh, the situation so and i have a conversation tomorrow with these people and uh, they asked me how to organize in order to uh, of course um, be uh, more efficient in the try in the in the battle for better status etc cetera, etc cetera. and so there are, there are lessons to draw from uh, the, what I know from the performing arts. Uh, that's, that's the main situation. And the last point is, uh, you mentioned the state, but in France, the, the, the main support to the arts comes from the local authorities. And this is really important. As you know, uh, now the festivals, all this... Uh, huge dispersion of activity around the, the territory is uh, is totally uh, turned down and um, and the local authorities are asked to take their responsibility in order to say exactly what they are able to uh, give to the arts now but there is such an uncertainty uh, regarding the end of this situation that it's i guess too early to uh, devise what comes out exactly. We know that huge organizations like the opera houses are in, in a very bad situation, but the state is there to support them still. Uh, but in the cities, maybe it's different. The orchestras are preserved up to now, etc., etc. I guess it's not exactly, uh, Isabella showed, it, show, showed that uh, earlier, um, in the United States, it's it's really a miserable situation. The orchestras are hit completely, often totally destroyed by, and the, the salaries are the opera houses. In France, not so. The part that that's the tradition of a strong cultural policy, of course, and in Germany too. And so we see the so the the the, the lesson of history, or at least the. 20th century's history in terms of cultural policy. Thank you, Pierre. Maybe before passing the word to Isabella, we have already some questions that are very interesting, so I will just uh, read them to you. First, one is specifically for Pierre, another for Isabella, and we have some questions for both. So for Pierre, the, the question, it's, it says, it seems that the French system of internment in which Portugal is now taking inspiration in order to improve the economic sustainability of artists, put all the risk in the artist itself. Mm. Who keeps being the most fragile point of the artistic economic system? There is anything being thought in France in order to overcome the situation. So this is for you, Pierre. And for, uh, for Isabella, it says, thank you for Isabella for your talk and for the comparative overview. How do you imagine an, an economic and institutional context in which artists can really have agency? Do you know any specific example? So maybe we can first uh, address these particular ones and then to add the other ones. Maybe Isabella, perhaps? Uh, yes, thank you very much. This is a very interesting question. I um, I will give you the example uh, agency, how to do it. It's simple French example, uh, Festival d'Avignon uh, and the strikes. 
And it was such powerful that the uh, status, uh, the negotiation of the status of intermittent de spectacle were completely, um, in, in that moment, were uh, signed, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that, that advanced. Because without the uh, very strict opposition, it is very difficult to deal with, uh, with the political powers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Other thing, I, I, I think, but um, the, the problem is that uh, you have, except the, the big orchestra houses and opera houses and uh, uh, the artists are separate. And this is a huge problem. It is like with the strike in the 19th century, it was the big factories and factories stopped and their negotiations, etc. Today, uh, a lot of artists are working alone, separate, and they meet on a project. So this is very difficult. On a precarious situation, it is difficult to organize a strike. I think about the audiovisual. Um, <laughs> television is uh, very important. So if you have the public television in one country and other televisions, perhaps the, the organization of some actions, but we need to be un united and, and solidarity is the word. Uh, yes, and I, I know this, the examples where the artists were protected and were cherished, etc. They're not always the very good examples, uh, because frequently or sometimes uh, in Eastern Europe, we know it, uh, the artists were protected by a dictatorial power. Uh, it, so, but uh, this is uh, the, the agency, I think, is... Uh, could come also with this uh, Finnish example of the education. When the Finland imposed classical music or music, uh, shortly speaking, uh, during all sc the school years until 18 years old and uh, until baccalaureate, and uh, you, if you go to Helsinki, you would like to go to the concert, not today, but ordinary time, you cannot buy the tickets. It's impossible, and you see the public is young. So the education, we, we need to care about children, and uh, this is a long perspective, probably. So two, two things, to be together, and I think so. Thank you, Isabella. Maybe um, I would add another question, Pierre, because it's related to the one that which was asked if, if, if there is a risk, as I was reading, to put the, the costs in the individual. And also Daniel Marques was asking, um, he thanks for the talks, and then he says, as Menger showed, the social protection scheme for intermittent workers in France, which is this discussion, it is also now in Portugal, has rising costs. How can we make the system sustainable? Or if it is possible to, which are the, what are the possibilities that you know or that the government is thinking about? He also suggests, should we have a sort of tax for the artists that make large sums of money to sustain artists that earn less? Thank you. Go ahead, Pierre Michel. Okay. Uh, as to the last question, maybe let's start with that. Uh, the system can be made sustainable, and but it's highly technical. I, I made some proposals in order to improve the system. And it's based on what we call experience rating in the insurance system. That means uh, when an employer draws on the unemployment uh, fund more than another, uh, he should pay more uh, allowances to the or taxes to that system than the one who doesn't need uh, uh, to draw on this uh, on this system and this is that means that the taxes are proportional to the use more or less intensive use of the system employers make but employers didn't uh, of course objected that it's impossible to implement it's perfectly possible to implement that but they are, would they would loss of course uh, they have they would suddenly uh, object that it's it's too complicated etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, because and this is why there were um uh, they built huge coalitions with the workers in order to protect the system as it works now and deficit is not their problem so 
it can be made sustainable. In fact, the problem is larger than uh, uh, extends over the, the limits of the arts. Uh, all the independent workers uh, now, just now, during this pandemic crisis, uh, want to be protected too and uh, to get some way to uh, overcome this earning losses, uh, these huge earning losses. Um, and uh, maybe the, the system could be improved in, in the way I mentioned. Uh, but you see that if you read French, you can find all the details in my, in my book uh, and in papers uh, written in English or in French. But uh, it's possible, of course. Uh, what is not possible is to uh, uh, put a limit on this unbalanced growth. That means if you have a flexible system with employers having nothing to, uh, having not to take care of the career of their artists, that means that they are free to hire and lay off Whatever, whoever they want. And so this unbalanced growth of uh, supply, people being, being attracted to the, uh, to the creative industries uh, to, to play, uh, to, to be artists, to be creative people, etc., etc. But in the same time, the demand uh, growing less rapidly means that, uh, as I mentioned and as I showed, uh, the, the total amount of work is split uh, in, in tinier parts uh, more and more. And so the, the job, job the contracts are shorter, et cetera, et cetera. And this is, not, this is built in the system. So, uh, and, and so you, you have short-term maybe advantages of that system, but long-term uh, drawbacks, uh, as I mentioned for pensions, for example. And after age 50, then the situation becomes worse for people because you are not the early bird, uh, you, are have, you are aging. Uh, there are more and more people uh, trying to enter the, the, the trade and to make a, a career in the arts. And so, you are considered uh, after 50 uh, to be dispensable. So that's, that's not uh, compensable. And this is one of the aspects of this unbalanced growth in the arts. Uh, of course, uh, there are huge advantages of flexible working systems, as I mentioned, because creativity is flexible in, in, in a sense uh, from one project to the other. So you need that. But in order to build a, a, a very secure employment system, sustaining that, that high rate of content chain of change content, um, this, is, this is very difficult. And uh, so, uh, but it's, it's a combination of resources. In fact, every artist combines resources. Uh, Isabella mentioned it. Uh, there are resources coming from multiple jobs. There are resources coming from the family, from the spousal partner, from uh, whatever. From and so uh, this this combination is very usual. And uh, so uh, the the point is, which is the best combination? Of course, and it's evolving during the life course. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre Michel. We still have two questions that uh, I would like to, to from our from our audience. One is Claudia Lomba. She is she thanks the inspiring presentations to both of you. And she asked, what is your opinion about the role that cultural organizations financed with public funds should have in the promotion of the labor conditions of the artists? This is one. Another that uh, it's also striking, it's been discussed in Portugal, is from Salome Costa. And she asks, she asks, I wanted to ask you also, what is, how do you see the fact that many artistic activities promoted today in COVID times are free? Artists still need a source of income. Well, this so uh, this is this is this is the, the, the main question. She has a comment, but I think the important thing is that uh, uh, 
uh, art is being promoted for free and how should we address this issue because we don't know if it will be too long or too short so it's it's really a question so maybe i will pass the, the, the maybe the, the the questions to isabel and then pierre michel Uh, thank you. Uh, just picking up on the last uh, questions before you ask the new questions, I would say that uh, as a researcher and precarious researcher, I would say that we are also in a very similar situation with the flexibility and probably the artistic field, uh, the artist, their extreme version of the system. And certainly it is the case that we are having now and we are passing through now because research uh, perhaps not yet in France at that level but in other countries uh, it is a really a precarious situation uh, sometimes to the end of the career uh, and also depends on the resources different resources different situations etc and also this is typical for the job uh, which are run on passion because a uh, musician or artist, uh, they will play whatever they will brief, yes? And money, we will see after. And the, the, the uh, public is used to it, that if you're a crazy musician, it, you know what is also crazy, how you recognize a, a real scientist? Because he forget to eat. He's working in a laboratory and he forget to eat. And this is this, uh, advantage that other people can take from a uh, uh, hard working uh, part of the society because artists, they're uh, hard working persons. And how to do it uh, during the COVID? And I, I think that this is a very good occasion to show people that we are indispensable. I'm saying we because I was artist in the previous, my previous life. So we artists, we are indispensable and you survive Thanks to us. Uh, and after to say, uh, but you know, this is the contract, so I need to eat also. So also to show people that uh, artist is not only performing, but also is practicing at home, is creating something, is maintaining his skills because the skills are really ephemeral. In in several speciality, this is like you. You don't know when you practice one day, uh, but the second day your co-workers, they realize that you didn't practice and the third day your public will realize that you stopped to practice and we need to practice, yes? So this um, situation need to be known to large public and we need to really recreate this social agreement, social contract, I think. And the politics, they, need to see that the society cares about us and something happened there. And you know, the, in a country as Poland, the politicians don't like artists, very creative artists. So it is also kind of uh, agency, yes? We are small, look and the bank see what's going on, yes? This is very powerful. So this is not nothing. We, we need simply to really organize ourselves and uh, to, to be important. And I would like to know, to, 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 to remember, to, to, to recall that, for example, in Africa, uh, uh, griot, they are very important part of the society. This is why also perhaps their message in this song is so powerful because the society charged them on a, uh, you know, they have no psychoanalysis, etc. This is the role of being healthy. So I, I think that is uh, the case. For Portugal, situation in Portugal, I'm sorry, I don't know. So I'm not really able to ask your precise question about the state, how to manage this, yes. Thank you, Isabella. Pierre Michel? Yes, uh, regarding the issue of labor laws and labor uh, working conditions, I guess, at least in, in the major countries, there are working condition uh, surveys and uh, quite precise and uh, there are 
there, there is a respect for all the, peop- the cultural, the major cultural organizations, of course, are submitted to uh, respect of labor laws, and uh, they cannot do what I, what I want, of course. And in France, the collective organization, the unions are very, very tough on uh, uh, getting the best working conditions, even in the arts, of course. And the arts are like other sectors. The creative economy is made out of uh, working conditions like in other sectors. So it should be understood that this is normal, the normal situation. And the the creative artist is not someone who is uh, totally uh, without uh, eating anything, et cetera, et cetera, getting uh, ill, et cetera. But of course, and this was mentioned earlier too, the health coverage is part of the larger working conditions of all workers and the artists, of course, in crises like this one are hit when they are not covered by uh, this health coverage uh, um, programs like in America. In France, it's different. Social security is okay. And uh, it's different for authors, writers, etc. This is a kind of battle still in, 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 uh, in progress because people are, of course, uh, uh, not covered like salaried workers. That's, that's a main issue, yeah, of course. Um, about free labor, I don't exactly understand what free labor means. If free labor is labor for free, that means I, I, I am a professional artist and I work for free. That's, that's not normal at all, of course. And uh, this is quite unfair. If free labor is, um, or is labor for less than a fair wage, this, can, this is a matter of negotiation and contract and battle and fight too. Uh, If it's a matter of amateur work uh, against professional work, this is a a very, uh, very long history of battles between amateurs and professionals. Uh, There is a marvelous book by Cyril Ehrlich about the the battle between the unions in the 19th century and uh, earliest uh, 20th century uh, m- union of musicians against the amateurs because the amateurs provided concerts for free and this was unfair competition and uh, the french unions are on the same uh, position now uh, they are uh, upset by amateur but this is on the one side you can say okay working for free is a kind of unfair competition but on the other side amateur uh, activity is a kind of soil on which you can build uh, the expansion of uh, cultural participation etc cetera, etc cetera. and this is this is a major concern i guess uh, yes so- yeah, michelle but i think sorry to interrupt you the question i think it was uh, if i understand correctly because in, in within in, with uh, during this covid time since uh, march yeah particularly, there were a lot of people in Portugal, like musicians, performers, uh, people from theater, etc., that gave free, not charging, free concerts, performances online. And I think this is the the question that is being addressed. Now, uh, and some some people were charging, like imagine you would pay 20 euros, but you just pay five. And this, this, I think this is the question. It's not the question on free work since ever, but yeah, yeah. the question mm-hmm. nowadays. Now, I don't know if it happened in France, but in Portugal it happened a lot. I guess there are, there, there, there are two answers, maybe. Uh, the first one is, uh, it's a way to uh, stay alive and to, to, to maintain a reputation uh, uh, and visibility uh, for an audience uh, through different means, etc. The other, other answer is, what about the platform, the platform economy that is built in order to charge people with uh, content going through the internet, etc.? And this is, of course, a major uh, turning point. If the platform economy takes advantage of a crisis and uh, can reward people even uh, less than expected but uh, a, a small selection of people. And on the other side, people acting like free agents, uh, trying to build their own platform without any rewards. This is a kind of 
uh, major diver divergence and split between two worlds. And so I guess it, it, maybe it's only temporary. And uh, I hope there is something maybe coming out of it. That means organizational, collective um, platforms emerging from that. Uh, run by artists themselves and not by media industries. Uh, so th that will be seen. But of course, you're right. Uh, there is a kind of, so working for free today in order to get hired tomorrow. That's, that's the major investment. It's a kind of investment. But it's not, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the problem is I need money <laughs> right yes. now, not It's not fair. It's not fair. <laughs> yes. We, we have a last question and we are in our time. So we just ask you to be brief. And then if you would like to add the final comments, it's from Maria Margarida Marinho Moreira. She asked if, if it's, it's, it's an interesting question. If you consider that the measures as the basic income, if it is implemented, could have a positive impact on sustainability and its freedom for the artist. Hmm. I don't know. Yes, I don't know if Isabella or Pierre would like to address. Yes, Pierre. <laughs> uh, basic <laughs> income, it, it's a huge debate about basic income, which kind of basic income. Uh, of course, artists will be part of it, but not only artists, everybody. So it, it's, it's not very specific to the artists. Uh, but so the point maybe that could be add is that the artists have been quite uh, smart uh, at building a system, a multi-layered system in France. That means that uh, the basic layer is a kind of security layer. The, the compensation for unemployment is, acts like that. It's kind of egalitarian layer uh, on which the people can uh, uh, count in order to make a part of a living. And on the top of that, there are different layers that, of course, are very unequal according to one's reputation, etc., etc. If you have that in mind uh, in order to implement a kind of basic income, of course, you will not suppress the huge inequalities, but you will maybe... Um, ease the situation of the worst uh, paid artists up to a certain point. But it, of course, uh, goes well beyond the, the case of the artists. Yes. Thank you. Isabella, would like to add any comment on this? Yes, I think about Isaac Bachelet Singer. Uh, yeah. Nobel Prize winner uh, in the Yiddish language, and uh, he, you know, uh, he wrote all his life because he wrote for the uh, journal, and he needed once per week had have his story, and it was like Shaharazad story because uh, people bounce, etc. So this story never ended, etc., etc. And this is how he uh, wrote amazing pieces. And we can ask how it will be if he had this basic income. Uh, so it depends. For some, uh, it is like a stimulation. And for others, it is very stressful. And I think basically for the artists who need to drop the core activity, because in each artistic activity, I, I, as, show, I, I as shown in this uh, last uh, slide, the sociological slide, it, you have very really different tasks. And if uh, you think about the income and you need only to devote all your time to commercial work, so you're frustrated and uh, very uh, uh, quickly you will be burned out and unhappy, etc. Et and so you will hate the music or whatever you, you do. Uh, th this is about the balance. And uh, as a, this is politi political question, I'm absolutely for minimum income for everyone. And in no. that, everyone. <laughs> And after, if someone feels that he's artist and will work, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, so that is probably thank you. thank you. So we are almost in the end of our talk. I don't know if you, if Isabella would like to add a final remark, and Pierre Michel. 
So thank you uh, warmly and uh, of course hope that uh, these uncertain times will have an end uh, as soon as possible in order for us to live again and to enjoy uh, concerts, uh, the arts, uh, the audiences, uh, the public and the public encounters, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's, that's our hope and uh, my hope and uh, I am really um, uh, sad to be uh, so uh, kept in my house or apartment and now I'm going to curfew um, training us etc. So this is the kind of um, yeah, pr uh, deprivation of freedom that's and creativity that's really hard to stand. Thank you Pierre-Michel. Isabella? Yes, thank you very much for organizing and I was ha very happy that it was however the way to meet and to share and I'm thinking about all the artists and not only artists, but uh, music lovers, arts lovers, dance lovers, etc., who are uh, today uh, on the street. And I think about our refugees in Europe and not only in Europe, or people without home who will uh, not even be able to share uh, as we were. We, we did it and thank you very much to all artists who think about them because the majority of, of society unfortunately forget it. Thank you, thank you Isabella. We would love to leave in, on behalf of me, Vera and Liliana, we really would like to thank you to Isabella Wagner and Pierre-Michel Menger to being with us. We, are, we really appreciate and we admire truly your work. It was a pleasure to be online. So here online, <laughs> we hope we can me be present in 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 presence. Who knows in the in the near future? We hope in the near future. Thank you so much Thank you for, for your contributions. So I would like to just finish the this moment of the seminar today. I will remind you that tomorrow at 8.30 we will have a roundtable that will be held at Kulturgest and we will keep on this, discussing this issue. So you are quite welcome to, again, uh, participate in the, in the roundtable and to ask your questions again in the link that uh, Kulturgest provides and uh, to be live on YouTube and on Facebook. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye.